<laughs> oh, no, not again, muttered the white-haired toy maker as the worn handle fell off the wooden chest he was carrying. He struggled to balance the chest as the handle clattered to the floor. Oh, how many times will I have to repair this old thing? He put the chest on a cluttered table, carefully opened the lid, and removed a snow globe set in a hand-carved wooden base. Shaking it, he looked inside. As the swirling snow settled, the small town of Pine Bough appeared. The toy maker adjusted his spectacles and peered closer as the tiny town came to life under the spell of the falling snow. Three children ran down an icy street, two chasing the other. The toy maker flinched as a snowball splattered on the neck of the boy being chased. Well, that sure was mean, he sighed, and then looked at his companion, a mechanical dog fashioned from a patchwork of parts. This won't be easy switch, the toy maker warned. They're almost here. I'd better hurry and get this handle fixed. He set the globe down and reached for his tools. Outside, the faint sound of bells jingled above muffled voices and Christmas carolers. This was Christmas Eve, and a magical feeling filled the air. Most people might have explained it as holiday excitement, but some knew that it was more, much more. Exactly as the toy maker's globe had shown, three children raced through the town. Maggie hurled a hard-packed snowball, which splattered squarely on Jake's neck. Shivering, he darted down an alley. Maggie followed closely as Doug lumbered behind. Suddenly, Jake found his escape blocked by a wooden fence at the end of the alley. "'Where's our money?' Maggie demanded. Jake gasped, I, I told you I don't have any. Maggie laughed. Well, poor boy, how can I keep Doug from beating you up then? Doug sneered and cracked his thick knuckles. But Jake quickly squeezed through a slit in the fence and bolted off before Doug could get his meaty hands on him. Maggie attempted to follow, but her bulky coat caught in the fence. Doug snickered as Maggie's face burned with anger. Oh, you laugh it up, Chubby, she said, and just wait till I get out. Doug scowled. If you're going to call me Chubby, then I won't be here when you do. Maggie responded, Okay, Tubby, get me out of here. With that last insult, Doug turned to leave Maggie in her predicament. But something caught his eye, and he paused. Hey, Maggie, did you notice where we are? He pointed to a nearby building just outside the haunted old Finnegan place. He looked her in the eye. They say that sometimes you can hear noises inside, but if you sneak in, nothing's there. Just then a stack of boxes tipped over nearby, and a cat shouted out from behind. Growing afraid, Maggie struggled to free herself. Eyes wide, Doug glanced once more at Maggie and took off running. He shouted back, maybe you'll think twice before calling me Tubby. As his footsteps faded in the distance, Maggie began to shiver, but not from the cold. She wriggled again and then froze in fear as the door to the building creaked open. Out rolled Switch. Maggie's heart thumped faster as the feisty assembly of mechanical parts scrambled toward her, his wheels squealing loudly. He yapped with a metallic bark that sounded like it came from inside an empty can. He looked and sounded so funny that Maggie couldn't decide whether to scream or, or to laugh. Then a white-haired man appeared from behind the door. Switch, knock that off. You'll scare that little troublemaker before I do. Leaning on the open door, he looked suspiciously over his spectacles at Maggie and added, Dogs are a great judge of character, you know. Maggie gulped. Are, are you a, a ghost? A ghost, <laughs> the man chuckled. Sure, the ghost of Christmas past. Boo! <laughs> he laughed again. Actually, I'm a toy maker, and I secretly use this place every year to help Santa prepare for Christmas. 
I don't believe in Santa Claus, Maggie interrupted. Oh, oh, you'll believe I'm a ghost, but you won't believe in Santa. Now that's funny. The man grinned, but Maggie grew impatient. Stop talking and just get me out of here. The toy maker didn't seem to be in a hurry to help Maggie. Maybe I'll just leave you stuck in that fence to think about your manners. Then, with a twinkle in his eye, he continued, Better yet, I'll help you out if you promise to help me in return. Maggie reluctantly agreed. Without moving from the doorway, the man asked, Have you considered just slipping out of your jacket? Maggie easily slid out of her coat, wondering, Why didn't I think of that? As she stepped forward, Switch growled. Switch, she said. That's a silly name for a whatever that thing is. The man smiled. I made him to remind me of Pete, a little dog I once had. I put Switch together from some of the spare parts I keep around here. He was just a funny little toy until I flipped this Switch on his stomach, and, well, he sort of came to life. So there you have it. Switch. Maggie shrugged. So what do you need me to do, anyway? The toy maker replied mysteriously, Let me get something for you from the shop. Maggie considered running off, but her curiosity overcame her, and she tried to peek inside. Have a look, the man called over his shoulder. Maggie sneered, But I might see what Santa's bringing me. Don't worry. There's no coal in here, he chuckled. Maggie slowly approached the doorway. As she entered the shop, a magical, wondrous world appeared. Maggie stared as if in a dream. Handcrafted toys, delicious-looking candy, and every sort of Christmas novelty filled the room from floor to ceiling. Shelves laden with mysterious trinkets sagged under the weight of their loads. Knick-knacks and furnishings of all sizes, from the tiniest candy cane to a large quilt embroidered with a Christmas tree, cheerfully adorned the packed shop. More wonderful yet, many of the toys and decorations were moving, not with the typical toy-like actions Maggie was used to, but as if they were alive. In this enchanted place, which seemed to embody all of Christmas in a single room, Switch seemed almost normal. The man grinned proudly as Maggie stood just inside the doorway, still gazing in awe. My name is Mr. Finnegan. And as you can see, I make toys. He smiled warmly. Everything you see here has a special purpose meant just for that person who is to receive it. The trick is to match up the item to the person. And that young lady is done through the magic of Christmas. There's nothing magic about Christmas. If there was, why didn't I get what I wanted last year? I was good, really good, and all Santa brought me was toys. Mr. Finnegan replied, Do you think Santa's the only one who can give us the gifts we want? There are some things he can't give. Santa's presence simply remind us of a much greater gift, a gift inside ourselves. Mr. Finnegan lifted the fragile wooden chest by its recently repaired handle and placed it in a wagon. What's that old thing? Maggie asked sourly. This old thing is the giving chest. It once carried precious gifts to a newborn king. I need you to deliver it to someone. Maggie Brighton, is, is there a treasure inside? Mr. Finnegan raised a brow. For some people, indeed there is. As he turned to write down the delivery address, Maggie quickly peeked inside the chest. It was empty. She looked around the shop. Don't you have anything better for me to deliver? Nothing better, Mr. Finnegan replied. Because of its noble heritage, this chest can magically deliver gifts for people in need. Here's the address. Now hurry before it's too late. So if it's magic, can I get a gift from it? Maggie tried to look innocent. Mr. Finnegan chuckled. No, but I can get a gift for you. He went on, you don't use the giving chest to get gifts for yourself. 
You use it to help others. Lifting the lid, he gazed inside. Well, would you look at that. What is it? cried Maggie. You tell me, Mr. Finnegan replied, opening the chest wider to reveal a beautiful gold-chained pendant with a heart-shaped diamond. He gestured for Maggie to pick it up. As she did, she realized it was identical to the necklace her grandmother had always worn. She remembered her grandmother's dying wish that her pendant be used to help someone in need. But even though the pendant was very valuable, Maggie's father had wanted it buried with her grandmother, and so it was. Maggie glared. This was my grandmother's. How did you get it? I didn't, Mr. Finnegan explained. You saw for yourself it came from the chest. I imagine she wants you to have it. My grandma's gone. She died last Christmas, Maggie argued. Are you saying a ghost gave me this? No, not a ghost, he replied. More like an angel. And she isn't gone. Just gone on ahead. Maggie's eyes narrowed. You're playing tricks on me. How come you know so much anyway? Mr. Finnegan smiled. You don't get to my stage in life without knowing something about death, Maggie. I never told you my name. Maggie's eyes filled with angry tears. I, I don't believe in angels. I, I hate Christmas and I hate you. She spun around, turning her back on the old man. Our deal's off. I, I don't believe in any of this. Mr. Finnegan followed as she stomped out the front door. Just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it's not real, he whispered. Then, leaving the wagon and chest outside, he disappeared back into his shop. Maggie looked back. Did that chest really have magical powers, or did Mr. Finnegan just slip the pendant inside without her seeing? Was this really her grandmother's pendant? And if so, how did that old man get it? Maggie knew that to find the answers to those questions, she needed to make the delivery. Sighing, she put the pendant in her pocket and went back to get the wagon. On Maggie's way to the address, she saw a woman shivering on a step. Just for an instant, Maggie's eyes met hers. Then Maggie lowered her gaze. But the image of the woman's deep blue eyes still burned in her mind. They looked familiar somehow. As Maggie passed, the woman asked if she had any money to spare. No, Maggie responded. The woman looked at the chest. Oh, but I'm so cold. I don't have anything for you, Maggie rudely replied, opening the chest to prove it. But to Maggie's surprise, inside lay the Christmas tree quilt she had seen earlier in the shop. In shock, Maggie handed the soft quilt to the woman. She wrapped it around herself and smiled pleasantly at Maggie. You're an angel. It can be hard to give away something special to someone who needs it more than you do. Thank you, my dear. Maggie smiled slightly as she walked away. She remembered her grandmother's blue eyes and turned for another look. But the woman was gone. Now more curious than ever, Maggie decided to test the chess on others along her way. She gave a football to a boy, a violin to a young woman, and a cane to a man with a limp. Each time Maggie opened the chest, she found a new gift, something she had seen in the toy shop. And as she gave, Maggie grew increasingly excited and happy. Something was still missing, though. This was almost too easy. Still, Maggie felt happier than she had in a long, long time. Then Maggie saw a couple pleading with the police officer. How can you do this to us, the man asked. My wife will have her baby any day now. The officer sighed. I I'm sorry, but I'm just doing my job. Since your landlord died, his nephew says you can't stay here. He is the next of kin. I have to do what he says. Maggie hoped she could help, 
but she knew these people needed more than just a toy or a trinket. In the chest, she saw a large brown envelope. She handed it to the woman, who gave her a puzzled look. Maggie shrugged. The woman opened the envelope, revealing the deed to the house and the landlord's will, which the nephew said had been lost. The landlord had left the house to the couple in gratitude for their many years of caring for him. Maggie blushed as the woman tearfully thanked her, and then she continued happily down the street. It's just like Mr. Finnegan said, Maggie thought. This chest really does give just what people need. And with that, Maggie remembered her own gift from the chest. Excitedly, she pulled the pendant from her pocket and looked at it again. As she put it around her neck, Maggie felt warmth flow throughout her body. She smiled, knowing that her grandmother was still looking after her somehow. This pendant really was the best gift Maggie could have hoped for after all. She decided right then that she never wanted to lose this feeling. Back in the shop, Mr. Finnegan said to Switch, well, Let's see how our girl's doing. He shook the snow globe again, and as the snow settled, he saw Maggie reach the appointed address. <laughs> I knew we could count on her, he said. Indeed, as the globe had shown, Maggie cheerfully arrived in front of a tall doorway. She paused, thinking, If I deliver the chest now, I'll only give to one more person. But I can help more people if I bring it back later. Nobody will know the difference. Deep down, Maggie knew her decision was more selfish than she was admitting. But she didn't want to lose the good feeling she had felt all afternoon. Mr. Finnegan would understand, wouldn't he? She turned away from the large gray building. Suddenly she heard a familiar voice. It was Doug. Escape from the fence, huh? What's that in the wagon? Maggie was surprised to find that in spite of how mean Doug could be sometimes, she really wanted to share with him everything he had missed, especially the magic-giving chest. As she boasted of the day's events, Maggie couldn't hide her excitement. She explained how the chest knew just the right gift to give when opened. To Maggie's surprise, Doug didn't believe a word. Taunting, he snatched the chest from the wagon. Give it back, Maggie shrieked, grabbing at the other end. They tugged and fought until finally the fragile chest cracked and burst into pieces. Maggie stared in disbelief. She clenched her fist to give Doug the thrashing he deserved, but instead of anger, a wave of sadness overcame her as she looked at the shattered chest. Choking back tears, she said, just, just get out of here, Doug. Doug laughed nervously. Okay, he said, you can keep your stupid box. As Doug disappeared around the corner, Maggie loaded the splintered wood into the wagon. Never before had she felt so sad. Her mind began to race. Why did Doug have to spoil everything? And why didn't he believe her? Why did that old woman make her open the chest in the first place? If not for her, Maggie would have taken it straight to the address. Why had Mr. Finnegan given the chest to her, anyway? She felt herself sink even lower as she began to worry about the person who really needed the chest, but wouldn't get it now because of her selfishness. Maggie trudged back to the gray building, where a young boy answered her knock on the door. It was Jake. Seeing Maggie, he gasped, How did you find me? Maggie pulled the wagon closer as Jake backed up. Relax, I'm not here for you. I'm just delivering a chest. Jake skeptically eyed the broken pieces of wood. Maggie added, I didn't even know this was your house. Really, Jake asked. Maggie looked down. Really, and I'm sorry for being so mean. Want to come in, Jake said. So Maggie did. The house was warm and bright. Just then a woman entered the room. May I help you? Maggie explained what had happened and apologized for the broken chest. Ashamed, she tried to change the subject. 
Well, you, you sure have a nice big house here, she blurted out. The woman smiled and said it was a home for orphans and homeless children. For the first time that evening, everything made sense. Now Maggie knew why Jake dressed the way he did and why Mr. Finnegan wanted her to deliver the chest here. These children must have needed a special gift. But with the chest destroyed, Maggie had failed in her mission. Then Maggie had a thought. Her grandmother had wished her pendant could help someone. Maybe she could give it to the orphanage. But the pendant was the one thing Maggie would ever get from the broken chest. Her own grandmother had sent it to her. How could she give it away? Then Maggie remembered what the old woman had said. It can be hard to give away something special to someone who needs it more. She took a deep breath and handed the pendant to the woman. This is from my grandmother. Oh, the woman hesitated. Are you sure? This is a very expensive necklace. But Maggie insisted. She would have wanted, I mean, she wants you to have it. The woman smiled gratefully. You don't know how much this means to us. Your gift will help make this Christmas a special one for the children. Thank you. Maggie felt a new kind of joy. This was the first time she had offered something truly of herself, not from the chest. It felt different, better. Maggie realized she had received more from the giving chest than just the pendant after all. She had even made a few friends along the way. Maggie smiled at Jake. At that moment, a little gray-haired dog ran into the room and looked up at Maggie, wagging his tail. The woman raised an eyebrow. Hmm, Peter usually doesn't pay much attention to strangers. And with a twinkle in her eye, she added, Of course, dogs are a great judge of character. The woman became serious again. I forgot to ask who sent the chest. Maggie told her it was a gift from Mr. Finnegan. Mr. Finnegan? The woman looked at her intently and invited Maggie to follow her to a nearby portrait on the wall. This is a picture of my husband. Is this who sent you with the chest? It was Mr. Finnegan. Yeah, that's him, Maggie said. But if he's your husband, why didn't he just bring the chest himself? The woman pointed to an inscription on the frame. Maggie's eyes widened as she read it. In memory of Nicholas Finnegan, whose service and generosity made the Finnegan Memorial Orphanage possible. Not gone, just gone on ahead. Forever our guardian. Jake spoke up. Maggie, you look like you just saw a ghost. Maggie thought for a moment and then smiled. Not a ghost. More like an angel. Maggie looked again at Mr. Finnegan's portrait and whispered, I I'm so sorry for being selfish. I don't hate you, and I don't hate Christmas. Thanks for helping me understand. And though she wasn't sure, Maggie thought she saw Mr. Finnegan wink at her. She felt a wonderful warmth come over her, as if Mr. Finnegan himself were giving her a hug of approval. This is the best feeling of all, she thought. As the sun set on Pine Bough, the faint sound of jingling bells could be heard, and that magical feeling still filled the air, the feeling that was more than just holiday excitement. But now a few more people knew why. Mr. Finnegan shook the snow globe once again. Gazing inside, he saw the beginning of a bright new day where two young friends were laughing and playing. He breathed a sigh of contentment and placed the snow globe back on the shelf. <laughs> the End <laughs>